Welcome to the True Love Secrets Reveal Telesummit. Today we have with us the most beautiful, talented, wise Bex Burton. Bex is a trauma-informed certified life coach who helps independent women attract and grow lasting love without sacrificing who they are or what they want out of life. After painfully hitting the same walls in love for over a decade, Bex committed to the study and practice of lasting love. Today, she enjoys a deeply connected partnership of 11 years with the man of her dreams. Through her signature programs, Your Majesty and Core Joy Living, she helps other independent women to do the very same, attract and grow healthy, lasting love. Welcome, Vex. Thank you, Natalia. It's wonderful to be here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's a treat to have you. So my first question is, uh, what are boundaries? We are going to be talking about boundaries today. What are boundaries and why are they important in dating and relationships? Yeah, absolutely. So simply put, Boundaries are what we will and will not tolerate, what we will and will not accept, how we wish and what we do not wish, how we do not wish to be treated. It's just a very clear indication of what our standards are, what our preferences are, and what we need to receive and reciprocate in a loving relationship. And the reason why they're so important is because they help us own our voice. They, they help us set the tone for any relationship mm. and how, again, how we wish to be treated. They help us, like I said, own our voice, stand in our power, express our worth and our value. Mm. And also they, it's an act of self-love to, to be able to express a boundary. Because when we express a boundary, we're saying, hey, I love myself more than this treatment or this behavior that I'm receiving from you. That is not acceptable. I do not accept that. There's no room for that behavior in my life. And if you're going to be in my life, this is what I need instead. So it's a reinforcement of our worth, our value, our self-love. You know, and we talk, when we talk in the in, in context of you know, a healthy love without, without sacrificing who we are or what we want out of life. Right. We have to become skillful in not only expressing these boundaries, but really like understanding them in the first place so that we're not on this, what I like to call the sacrifice gateway, where we're accepting things that don't really mesh with how we wish to be treated or what we desire in our love life. Oh my God, how wonderful, how wonderful. Now, how come if it's an expression of our self-love and confidence and if it's so healthy for us, why is it so hard to set boundaries in dating? Yeah, it's such a good question in dating and relationships. Right. It's challenging for a number of different reasons. And I think that at the, the core of all of these reasons, it's challenging because there is a risk Mm -hmm. that if we set this boundary, we will lose that person or lose that relationship. Right. So we often override our own boundaries because we want to be liked, mm -hmm. we want to be loved, we right. want the relationship with this person, we don't want them to leave, right. we don't want to feel rejection, we don't want the other person to feel rejection, we don't want to hurt their feelings or disappoint them or, you know, push them away in any way. So we right. make up all of these reasons to not express our truth, our, our authentic boundary to truth mm -hmm. in service of, of keeping, holding on to something that may not actually be in, in service to our highest good. Right. So what that, what that is coming up for me is if we don't, um, if we don't express our boundaries, if we don't set boundaries, how that works out over time, that doesn't work for us either, does it? No, that's that's such a great question, Natalia. What happens when we don't 
uphold. Mm. When we don't acknowledge our own boundaries, when we don't communicate them, when we don't uphold our own boundaries, what happens over time right. is that we begin to lose pieces of ourselves. Mm. We lose the piece of ourselves that feels empowered to speak up for ourselves. We start to go with the flow or override our own needs in service to the needs of others. Right. I mean, how many women out there take care of everybody else in their family or in their life before they take care of themselves? Yes. You know, how many women out there say yes, even when they're, you know, every fiber of their being is saying no, because they're afraid of the fallout of that no. Right. And so when we, when we override our no, or, or when we override our boundary, we're starting to, we're training those around us to believe that they can have their way or that we don't have an opinion or that our opinion doesn't matter or our needs don't matter. We're training our own consciousness and nervous system that our needs don't matter right. and that the needs of others matter more. And so we, like I said, began, we, we, that we begin to slowly erode who we are the, and, and not only just who we are, but sometimes the best parts about us and, and the best things that make us who we are, right. you know, and this is one of the ways that, you know, a, a woman will wake up five, three, five, 10 years into a relationship, look in the mirror and, and not recognize herself, not recognize the life that she has around her and wonder, how did I get here? How did this happen? Right. You know, and, and I mentioned that sacrifice gateway. And that is, I, I think of a sacrifice gateway as like the very first little boundary that you just don't speak or the very first time that you override your own preference in service of making somebody else comfortable. Right. Or we get into that habit. It's, you know, just like building a muscle, we're building the muscle that what we want and need doesn't matter. And, you know, and thus that, you know, and that doesn't create a healthy relationship because that creates an imbalanced power dynamic and other dynamics that are not con uh, congruent and helpful for lasting love. Right. So what I'm thinking is uh, now is, what is the most important element of boundary setting? Yeah, another good question. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of emphasis put on the communication skill and, and what to say and how to say, how to speak the boundary. And while that's very, very important, and that's something that I teach my clients, I give them scripts and frameworks to, to work with, to express themselves in adult skillful ways that are connecting rather than disconnecting. But I would argue that that's actually not the most important aspect of boundary setting. Mm. In my opinion, the most important aspect of boundary setting is the willingness to uphold the consequences. So mm. we have to understand because we can express our boundary left and right and up and down. And the person on the other end might hear it. They might apologize. They might commit to doing differently or doing better or upholding our preference in the future. Right. But then what happens when they cross that boundary again? Right. And then what happens when they cross that boundary again and again and again right. and again? We have to be willing to have a consequence action. Mm. Across the boundary. So, you know, one example is I read about this actually in a in an article where a, a, a woman, she was a married woman, and they had just had a child. So they needed a lot of help and support from their community, from their family. And their, uh, she gave her in-laws a set of keys to the house. Mm. And that set of keys to the house was intended for the times in which the in-laws were going to come take care of the child or come deliver groceries or come help. Right. And what happened was the in-laws were using that set of keys at will, randomly, mm -hmm. coming in unannounced. Right. And meanwhile, this young couple with this child, you know, they're trying to live their life. And having this interruption is surprising. It's inconvenient. And so having a boundary of, listen, we, we need you to be using these keys for the, the, the help that we agreed upon. You know, having that boundary set, that boundary was crossed, not once, not twice, but again and again. So the consequence action that had to be taken was this young family, they had to change their locks. 
Mm. They have to change their locks and let the in-laws know, like, look, this was a really difficult decision to make. Yeah. At the same time, we've asked you what we need and we're not getting what we need from you. So we've had to take this action, this consequence. Right, right. Sometimes so, that's the only option is to go there and take the, the hard action, do the difficult thing. Yeah. And, but at the same time, like what is, what's more challenging? <laughs> what, maybe not even challenging, but what's more painful? Right. Have somebody override your boundaries again and again and again and again and right. suffering the consequences, losing yourself and feeling your, your essence slip away, feeling the relationship deteriorate versus enacting a consequence action right. and be clear and direct and straightforward. This is, this is what needs to be done until we see different behavior. Right. It's, you know, it's, so what, like, it's like ripping the bandaid at once. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or going little by little by little for sure. For it sure. might be, it might be, um, yeah, a, a bandaid rip. I mean, it, it's neither option is ideal. Yeah. Let's it, be real. It's a, it's a situation <laughs> that, that, that sucks. It's, exactly. Yes, we yeah. are in a, in a situation that either way it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. I, what I'm hearing is we have to be mature enough to see the big picture and to, you know, to, to do what is right for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in that example, they gave them plenty of opportunities to, you know, to do it in a polite way, in a, in a nice way. And they weren't, I have probably, we all have been in that situation where we, we express the boundary, we express the boundary, we express the boundary. And eventually we are like, okay, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And in dating, another example, I have a client who um, she's a very high profile woman with a high performing position and she's online dating and she has a preference right. to have a video chat with any of her dating candidates before she gives out her phone number or commits to meeting somebody in person. It's a very neutral and low level ask, right? I just yeah. I want to have a video chat in the app before I give out my phone number. Totally reasonable. Right. And she has men, not many, but there are some men that push back and they say things like, I don't bite. You have nothing to worry about. I'm harmless. I'm a school teacher. And, you know, and many women, and here's, here's the thing. Many women would just unmatch, delete and move on right away. Right. And I would argue that even if this is not your guy, that right. is an opportunity to right. practice expressing your boundaries. Right. Because when you find the right guy, the need to express your boundaries isn't going to go away. And yeah. then the stakes are much, much higher when you've right. got a guy that you don't want to lose. Right. So why not be in the practice of, of expressing and reinforcing your boundaries before you block, delete, and move on? So that by the time you find the one that you that, that wants the same things that you do, you become this mutually committed, exclusive, romantic relationship. Now you've got the practice. Now you've built the muscle. You know what your needs are. You know how to skillfully express them. You know how to reinforce them. And you know what you're willing to give up. Right. You know the consequences that you're willing to act in order to honor yourself and honor your value and your worth in the relationship. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So Bex, I have a question for you that is coming up right now. In that situation, for example, the example of your client, she's um, she's having this free requirement, which is completely reasonable, I completely support it, I think it's perfectly fine. And um, in the way she commit, well, I don't know if using her as an example is a good thing, but let's use her as an example. Sure. Let's say in the way she communicates, she she uses the word, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I want the guy says, let's let's go out on a date. And she will she will say something like, Oh, I'm sorry, but I would like to get on a on a call first before we on a video call first before we meet in person. Yes. Yeah. So, what will you say about the I'm sorry, the apologizing before? It's absolutely unnecessary. And it and it it introduces a power dynamic that you don't want to entertain. Oh. There is no apology. Can you hear about that? Please, yeah. the power dynamics. 
Yeah. And there's, you know. there's no apology necessary for right. wanting what you want, needing what you need. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we talked with women so frequently that say, I don't want to come across as needy. Right. The truth is, you're a human being. Human beings have needs. Right. And having needs, desires, and preferences in your dating practice is a symptom of the human condition, of, of being a human being. Absolutely. There's no apology necessary for expressing a boundary. So instead of leading with, I'm sorry, lead with receptivity and gratitude. Right. You know, how, how lovely that you, how, how, thank you for reinforcing. I have nothing to be afraid of. I so appreciate your reassurance. At the same time, my preference is to have right. a video call in the app before I give out my phone number. Yes. Does that work for you? I am available X, X, and X. Beautiful, beautiful. What I have noticed with my clients that apologize, you know, until I coach them into not apologizing, is that the guys, they keep pushing. Mm -hmm. They keep pushing. It's, you know, even when they, when they reject them, when they go on a dating person and then they get the text, oh, you want to go on a second date and they don't want to for X, Y, or Z reason. And if they say, I'm sorry, you know, I had a good time, but it's not going to work for me right now. They come back with another thing. Like, what was it? Did I do something wrong or anything? So I, I it's, it's super, super important that to, yeah. to just be appreciative or, or say something positive building and that's it. Yeah. And I would say in cases like that, you know, if you, you know, especially in dating, especially if you haven't met in person, you know, and you're still kind of in that getting to know each other phase, maybe you have met in person, but if there's a proposal made that doesn't work for you, you express your boundary. If there's pushback, you reinforce the boundary and test where that lands. If there's continued pushback, then you get to move into a releasing conversation, you know? And again, like I'm, I, specialize in dating communications. And I firmly believe that it's important to follow the conversation through until you have that release conversation, unless you're in danger or, you know, there's, there's some harm or violent communication coming your way, in right. which case you want to immediately release and block and delete, obviously. But, you know, if it's, if it's somebody pushing back on your boundary, it's an opportunity to reinforce the boundary practice skillful communication. If there's continued pushback, then it's again, another opportunity to practice skillful communication in releasing and letting go. And at that point you can block and delete so that you never have to hear from them again. Thank you. What do you mean by release conversation? I never- Yeah, release conversation. I so appreciate your time. I enjoyed getting to know you. I'm not feeling the connection. I wish you the best. Release go fly, be free. You're not for me, fly, be free. And it's, you know, and, and I think the, the important thing about that, two things, you know, just because just, I get really passionate about this because I see so many men vilifying the men who are showing up unskillfully, you know, and it's like, why are we taking this so personally? This man is unskillful and that doesn't mean that he's evil. It doesn't mean that he's a bad person. It just means that he he's not for you. He's unskillful. Wow. He's not for you. So we don't have to make him wrong. We don't have to vilify him and treat him like, you know, a second class citizen. All right. He gets to show up in the energy of love, no matter who's on the other end, because, and I can't say this enough, because the more we practice communicating with the energy of love, the right. more we will be ready for the person that's ready to commit to us, the person that we want to share our life with. We don't just show up, you know, we don't just flip a switch the moment that we meet the right person and, and show up with loving energy and loving, skillful communication. We need practice. Love is a practice. Mm -hmm. So the dating practice is all about practicing loving energy. And, and it, so it's not about the guy that's right in front of you. It's not about the guy that's pushing back on your boundaries. It's about practicing for the guy that you're going to spend your life with. Right, right. 
I heard once something beautiful that I, I won't take ownership because I couldn't have thought of that. She was saying something in the term, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, like use every uh, candidate as, not use, I mean, but you know, like the situation as if he were somebody that is going to whisper to the one how you are, if he's going to give positive reviews or negative reviews. Yeah. So I thought that was so, so cool. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's really it, you know, because <laughs> contrary to popular belief, men do talk, you know, there are, there are signal threads and, you know, Facebook chats and things where women talk and do the same thing. So yes. it's it's best that we are, like I said, just practicing loving energy, regardless of, of who's on the other end, because it doesn't take that much effort. And I know it's challenging. Don't get me wrong. It's not an easy thing, especially if we've had a string of dates with less than extraordinary men. You know, right. our viral energy takes over, our protective energy takes over if we've been hurt, you right. know, but the work is recognizing the impulse to act out of eye roll energy or protective energy, recognizing that impulse as it arises, taking a sacred pause and making a, a different decision, a decision in service to love. Right. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And so a little bit beyond boundaries about dating, do you recommend to go on several dates with different men at the same time? in the same week or do you recommend going you know exploring one man and then if it doesn't work you jump into the next one and what is your vibe on that what do you think about yeah that? I think that that's a a very nuanced answer because I think that it's different for every woman who's dating right. and that there's multiple factors that contribute to how you approach dating your age right you know, whether or not you are um approaching the end of your childbearing years and you want children, right? Um, you know, if you're, you know, in your um, more seasoned midlife, you know, your advanced midlife and you're, you're looking at, you know, uh, a, you know, finite time ahead of you, mm. you know, but I'm definitely not opposed to abundance dating. Okay. Uh, another factor that contributes to whether or not a woman does this is that her energy budget. You know, how, how intense is your job? How much time do you have for yourself right. outside of working hours? And then how much time do you have beyond that? Because we don't want to override our self-care time, time with friends, family, the things that nourish us. We don't want to override that for dating. So for some women, that means she gets a video call and one in-person date a week. If that, for right. some women, that means she goes out on three dates a month. Right. You know, it just, it really depends on the woman, where she's at in her life and, and multiple factors beyond what I've just mentioned. Right. Um, but, you know, and I think that w if a woman doesn't inherently know that, uh, what her limit is and what her capacity is, you know, teaming up with a skillful coach like you, Natalia, or myself, or or even a therapist or counselor is wow. going to help a woman get clear on what she what what space in her life she has available for dating. Right, that's beautiful. I just love your answer, Bex. It's super, super good. It depends, and that I think is so. Yes, I mean. I went crazy and dated 200 guys in two years. <laughs> I, I was on a mission. That's my personality. When I do something, I am all in. Wow. Like, Amazing. I have, and I have endurance and energy and all that. So, but not everybody's like that, you know. Um, right. Some women have more time. I don't know, different things. Exactly. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I was committed to my partner. I think 10 days into 10 days after meeting him, we decided. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. I would love to hear <laughs> the story. Go. Oh, that's, that's a whole other interview, but there were, oh. there were lots of signs and synchronicities and, you know, this deep embodied knowing. And here we are 11 and a half years later, you know, we've, we've gone through the crucible. We've done the work. I mean, and we continue to do the work, you know, and I think that that's, that brings up another thing is that 
no relationship is perfect. You know, whether you go on 200 dates in two years or you, well, I, I definitely went on a number of dates and I, I did find somebody, but I committed in 10 days. We committed to each other in 10 days. Either situation, there's still work to be done. You know, just because we find the one doesn't mean that everything is cake and rainbows beyond that. You know, we need, <laughs> we're two massive universes coming together to live under the same roof. And it takes it takes effort and energy and focus and attention and skill to, wow. to make that work. And it can be challenging, but it's so rewarding. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you are a, a unicorn. You are that very, very rare case when it was kind of love at first sight, it seems like. It, well, it, um, I mean, I mean, it was at least, well, wow, he's hot at first sight. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't even that. I mean, my so? first, my first visual impression of him was like, wow, he's, he's cuter in person than he is in his dating profile. Um, but really for me, it was the energy mm. because I, this was, this was at a time when I was living in a big, big city. So my dating focus was way more in person. Okay. And I was really struggling and frustrated with the in-person, like the dating pool that I was in. I wanted to date outside of my social circle because I felt like I was finally ready for a real relationship. So I went online and I dated a couple of people here and there. And then I got this incredible message from a, you know, a very promising candidate. And as we were chatting back and forth, I come to find out that he's online dating for the same reason. He wanted to date outside of his social circle. So he chose to set up an online dating profile. Uh -huh. We keep talking and we find out that we actually share the same social circle. We have over 70 uh -huh. friends in common. We've been to a dozen of the same parties and events in New York uh -huh. and never met. Wow, so that, you are a unicorn. <laughs> it, for, like I say, it was the energy more than his appearance, more than oh, his income, you know, more than his physique. It's it's the, the energy. And I mean, and, and we don't have enough time, but I have like 20 other synchronicities that he and I experienced in that first month that to me was a signal from my highest self, from God's source universe, that this is my person. And I get to pay attention. At least this is my person for now. Right. Let's, let's commit and see where this goes. But we were, I mean, we were both in, all in. Oh, congratulations. I'm so happy for you. So, so happy for you. Thank you so much for all your generosity, sharing your knowledge, your, your expertise with us and with the, the viewers. And I know you have a, a gift uh, for our viewers. Would you mind to talk a little bit about it? I would love to talk about my gift. I have a collection of tools and resources for the single, excuse me, for the single women out there who are struggling finding quality candidates on uh, online or offline. It's an, an intentional dating toolkit. And there's, I think, at, uh, about a half a dozen tools in there, um, how to get better dates online, how to... Um, have the most highest quality profile, where to meet high quality men, how to dress for love. Oh my um, God, that's wonderful. Questions that lead to love. Um, six questions to weigh your non-negotiables through, you know, so that th there's so many women out there who have very high standards and they wonder, gosh, am I being too picky? Well, there's a tool in there to determine, are you being too picky or <laughs> Are your are, are your non-negotiables and your standards right where they should be? So it's an intentional dating toolkit, and you can find it at bexburton.com. And it's a, a simple download with loads of tools. And the cool thing is, is that I'm not done with it yet. So mm -hmm. when you get on that email list, you will also receive all the updates to that intentional toolkit. And I'm oh. aiming to have a new tool each month added to that toolkit. So you'll get all of the updates when you join that list. Bex. That's great. The link is below this video, so you can grab it right there. That's awesome. I'm going to get it too. <laughs> so thank you so much, Vex. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you, this conversation. There, there was so much value share, and thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for helping women to, to be happier in love and relationships.
Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, Natalia. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>